I never met a monster I didn't like. The life and times of. I am Iron Man. People, all the powers manifested in the people. We and said, uh, "You're the princess." Chefs kind of dig the book. <laughs> Live from New York, it's. Well, you know the rest. Yes. Only put your lead in my mustache. Remind for. This uh, portrait, in my opinion, bullet the linear painting. <laughs> Surrealism in its own right is an unusual and exotic artist movement, defined as an avant-garde movement in art and literature, which sought to release the creative potential of this unconscious mind. For example, by the irrational juxtaposition of images. Few could be compared to the realizations and manipulations of the mind and art other than Salvador Dali. There were also stipulations that his brilliance hinted at unfettered mental illness, and psychologists later referenced the artist's work and mannerisms as to why this is assumed. This becomes a rather poignant part of the world Dali helped create around him. The Spanish artist was born on May 11th in 1904 in Figueres, Spain. He is the son of middle-class lawyer, and I apologize because I know I'm going to mess these up. It's Dali y Cusi and Filipa Domenech Ferris <laughs> um, are his mother and father, and Salvador Dali's Full name is actually Salvador Felipe Jacinto Dali y Dominic. I'm only going to say that once. Um, at the age of five, his parents decided to take him to the grave of his older brother, who had died nine months prior to his birth, stating that this young boy was the reincarnation of the older child. Dali was also told his name was the exact same name as the child Susie and Ferris had lost prior. This would be shown to affect Dolly, stating several times that we resembled each other like two drops of water, but we had different reflections. He was probably a first version of myself, but conceived too much in the absolute. While he would have a younger sister named Anna Maria, it's likely that being told he had another's identity at such a young age possibly led to some of the issues he would cause or endure as he grew up. When asked what he would like to be when he was older, the child replied a chef or Napoleon. It was also noted that Salvador would also feel in competition with his father for the affection of his mother, who he adored. Sometimes this attitude led to even darker means. At the age of eight, he pushed a good friend off a bridge, causing the child to break his leg. Although the child was screaming and the scene was macabre, Salvador sat eating cherries quietly observing while the friend was attended to by their mother. He seemed to not be able to, or choose not to, connect to people even considered close, except for his paternal parent. Animals would also be dealt with animosity. Upon discovering an injured bat that was struggling against a hill of ants, Dolly decided the best thing to do was bite the head off the animal. Sorry, Ozzy. Dolly did it first. In spite of the trauma he may have endured or caused, the young Dolly would also begin to express his art. Often taking inspiration from their summer home in the village of Kadakis, he would produce sophisticated drawings of the bleak oceanic landscapes for even a well-developed artist. His parents recognized his skills and created an art studio at home before enrolling him in 1916 at the Colegio de Hermanos Martistas an institute in Figueres, Spain. True to his nature, however, this education wouldn't be taken seriously. Wearing out-of-date clothing and sporting long hair, Dolly would fall asleep in class, interrupt with his eccentric behavior, or be constantly daydreaming and ignoring his studies. Dolly would outburst against his stern father and any students that considered themselves dominant to himself. 
This would often cause more chaos within the home, as Kusi took a much stricter role than the boy's mother. Nonetheless, the skills shown by their son would in 1917 encourage his father to set up an exhibition of charcoal drawings. In 1919, Dolly had his first exhibition within the Municipal Theater in Figueres. This would be bittersweet for Dolly at age 16 was heartbroken when his mother passed away in 1921 from breast cancer. His father chose not to stay a widow, instead marrying the sister of his late wife. While this didn't endear the Surrealist to his father any better, he was known to be respectful of his aunt. Later in 1922, Dolly decided to stay as a student resident at the Academia de San Fernando of Madrid, Spain. Continuing his reputation of eccentricity and controversy, he began wearing notable sideburns along with his long hair, and dressing more akin to English lords in the 19th century rather than the fashion of his fellow students. He would become engrossed in several styles, most notably cubism and metaphysics. While he likely didn't understand the Cubist movement entirely, his abilities would earn him the attention of his fellow students. He took note of the avant-garde works like the Dada scene and classical painters such as Diego Valquez, who was the inspiration of Dali's later signature curled mustache. Dali had reportedly at a young age identified as a communist, anti-monarchist, as well as an anti-clerical. In 1923, he was suspended for criticizing the professors and was alleged to have started a student riot. Then in 1924, he was imprisoned by the primo de Rivera. The dictatorship declared him a person intensely liable to cause disorder. Within the same year, Dali would again be arrested, accused of supporting the separatist movement, and in turn be briefly imprisoned in Genoa. He would return to his academy in 1926, but would eventually be expelled before final exams. His last straw was declaring none of the staff competent to examine him or his work. After his expulsion, Dali would travel several times to Paris between 1926 and 1929. By this time, Dali was working within three styles, Impressionism, Cubism, and Futurism. During one visit, he met his artistic hero, Picasso. The awe of the Cubist shone through influencing numerous works after the meeting. Harris would also allow him acquaintance with Joan Miro, Paul Ollard, and Marguerite, all various artists that influenced him in the world of Surrealism. From here, the true meld of Dali's mind would explode towards the character we know today. Dali was an avid reader of Sigmund Freud's psychoanalytical theories about sexuality and mental health, which would eventually turn his work into three general themes. Man's universe and sensations, sexual symbolism, and ideographic imagery. This would also aid in Dali's contribution to the Surrealist movement in what he called the paranoiac method, a mental exercise of accessing the subconscious to enhance artistic creativity. Dali would use the method to create a reality from his dreams and subconscious thoughts, thus mentally changing reality to what he wanted it to be and not necessarily what it was. For Dali, it would become a way of life. The 1930s in particular would hold many opportunities and risks for the rising artist. Looking to explore his artistic abilities, in 1929 he would look into filmmaking with Louis Brunel, though his darker side would become prevalent within the film Un Che Andoule, or An Andalusian Dog, there was a grotesque scene of a human eye being seemingly cut open on the camera for the audience to endure. They would also go on to collaborate in L'Age Dior, or The Golden Age, in 1930. He gained his first patrons, Countess Marie Loa de Non, along with the French aristocratic couple Vice Count and Vice Countess Charles. During their patronage, the artist painted The Persistence of Memory in 1931, also known as Soft Watches. 
later becoming one of his best-known works with softened, melting clocks and bleak landscapes, his surrealism was captured in fine detail, overlaying of layers as done in classic art, while making the subject a known but altered form. Calling on his love of psychology and analytics, the overall theory for this work is that Dali is showing several ideas within the image. Mainly, that time isn't as rigid as we employ, and that everything is susceptible to destruction. Sometimes, in this case, Dali himself. When he officially joined the Surrealist group in 1929, he was deep into activist work of peasants and workers. Yet, as the party began to draw more Marxist ideologies, Dali became apolitical and refused to publicly denounce fascism. As the Second World War was growing in Europe, he refused to make a stand against the Spanish militant Francisco Franco, as many of the Surrealists had done. Although there was no concrete evidence to support a trial of his peers, nor that this was the direct cause of being cast out, it seemed more likely that members of this realist group were tired of Dali and his public behavior. Believed to be further fueled by his feud with the leader, André Breton, over Breton's accusation of Dali being in favor of Hitler. The artist was officially notified that his expulsion was due to counter-revolutionary activity involving the celebration of fascism under Adolf Hitler. The feud with Breton would continue until his passing. During the trials and tribulations of the 30s, Salvador would end up meeting a Russian immigrant named Elena Dmitrievna Diakonova, who was 10 years his senior, although she was married to a writer at the time, attraction formed between Dolly and Elena, causing her to leave her husband for the much younger Dolly, and married later in 1934 via civil ceremony. Called Gala by her smitten lover, she would be a major influence in his life, often called his muse. She would become a balance in his whirlwind of Dolly's existence, especially when it came to his finances. She would be his legal and financial advisor, negotiating contracts with exhibitions, galas, and dealers interested in her husband's art. Continuing his eccentricity, Dolly would attend galas as exuberant as his works. With his curled mustache, a cape, and walking stick, he would continue to watch his notoriety grow, especially with the art critics. One example was during 1934, when the American art dealer, Julian Levy, invited the Spanish artist to New York for an exhibition. Upon arrival, in his usual flamboyant manner, it was discovered he wore a glass case containing a brassiere on display. While attending the London Surrealist Exhibition in 1936, he gave a lecture which translates to Authentic Paranoid Ghosts. He stood at the front of the patrons dressed in a wetsuit, walking to Russian wolfhounds and carrying a billiard cue. He claimed his unusual attire was showing him plunging into the depths of the human mind. Regardless of critics and artists' opinions of himself or his work, he would continue to have surrealist displays into the 1940s. As World War II continued, Dali and Gala would end up moving to the United States, until in 1948, in which year they would return to the artist's beloved Catalonia. He would work with several movie makers, musicians, and other artists, allowing him to delve even deeper into the different mediums to experiment with. In 1941, the Metropolitan Museum of Modern Art in New York City would give him his own exhibition, and his autobiography, The Secret Life of Salvador Dali, published the following year. For Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound, which released in 1945, Dali's paintings were used specifically for showing the audience the character John Ballantyne's mental issues, creating a dream sequence that showed what was going on behind the mind of the person. As time moved into the 70s, Salvador would continue to work not only on canvas, but designing sets for theatrical performances, 
jewelry, and fashion shops. He would begin to bring more religious subjects into his art, several themes using gala, and exploring into erotic subjects stating they were to represent childhood memories. After seeing a concert set by Alice Cooper, Dolly requested to work with the rock star, stating it was like seeing one of his paintings come to life. Both are known for their eccentricities and uncomfortable staging. It was a match made in Surrealist Dreams. Dubbed the first cylindric chromio hologram portrait of Alice Cooper's brain, it was the first of its kind, a fusion of photography, art, and music that used the infancy of holographic projection to create the media. Dolly was not active in the United States during this time, however. From 1960 up into 1974, he worked on the plans for creating the Teatro Museo Dali. The building had once burned in the 19th century during the end of the Spanish Civil War and was also the site of Dali's exhibition at 14. The site was also close to two other important locations to Dali, the Church of St. Pierre, where he was baptized and received communion as a child, and the house where he had been born was a mere three blocks away. Officially opened in 1974, it had been designed by Dali on top of the original structure, and is known to be the largest storage of his work, with several pieces on permanent display. 1974 would also bring more turmoil for the artist. After dissolving his business relationship with his manager, Peter Moore, rights to his collection were sold without permission, costing him much of his wealth. Two of his friends, A. Reynolds Morris and his wife Eleanor, were wealthy collectors from the United States that had known the Surrealists since 1942. They worked together to create the Friends of Dolly, which would be a foundation to assist the artist. He would also establish the Salvador Dali Museum in St. Petersburg, Florida. As time moved on, the artist found his craft more difficult. In the 1980s, Salvador would come down with a motor disorder, causing permanent trembling and weakness that stopped his ability to hold a paintbrush, cutting off his most reliable form of self-expression. He would also lose his wife Gala in 1982. Becoming reclusive in his depression, he moved to Pueblo, to a castle he had bought and remodeled for his late love. There were several rumors that this was not only due to his depression, but due to his desire to hide from the public and possibly die alone. He stayed in seclusion until 1984, when a fire broke out and he was severely burned, leaving him bound to a wheelchair. Friends and fellow artists fearing for his well-being worked together to have him leave the castle and return to Figueres, where he could live at Teatro Museo. Then, in November 1988, he was taken to a hospital due to a failing heart. Only allowing a short recuperation, he returned to the museum and died the following year of a heart failure at 84 in the city in which he had been born. His funeral would be held in his beloved realm of art, and he is buried in the crypt nearby. And yet, the oddities of Dali would continue after his passing. In 1945, Dali had worked on an eight-month creation, Destino, or Destiny, for Disney Productions, but it wasn't released until 2003 when it was rediscovered. Continuing the adoration for his bleak beaches of Catalonia, we see the metamorphosis of two beings becoming one, with nods to Dali's works throughout the piece. His photography piece, Volpas Mors, or Women Becoming Skull, from 1951, would be used on the back of a deathhead moth for the sus suspense thriller Silence of the Lambs, created in 1991. The last scandal came in 2017 when a Spanish woman claimed to be the daughter of the late artist who was conceived with a hotel maid. Even with appeals from the Gala Salvador Dali Foundation against exhumation, the artist would be removed from his tomb for testing, as there was no physical items on display that would allow for collection of DNA otherwise. This was just to have the world find out that the results were negative. Throughout his history, Dali was exuberant, explosive, expressive, and manic. 
We were given a glimpse into madness and tempted to learn more about ourselves through his madness. While there are many great artists of the world, few will ever leave the legacy or mythos of Dali. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe to see more content like this. If you have any future subjects you'd like to see us do on the Life and Time series, please comment down below. If not, we hope you all have a wonderful day and a beautiful tomorrow.